Hello, welcome to drywalltechnique.com. I'm Layla and I'll be introducing you to Series 2, Taping and Finishing, so let's take some time to get familiar with some of the tools we'll be using in this segment. Drywall Tape Reel Sanding Sponge 6-inch Knife Water Sponge Sanding Pole with Screen we are going to concentrate on taping, so we'll be using a light taping compound that comes in a pre-mixed state. This will need to be thinned down for different applications. William likes to use BDX Light, Taping Joint Compound. William will be using this taping compound for taping the butt joints, flats, and angles before he thickens the taping compound to install the tape on corner bead. There are two different methods to mixing the pre-mixed taping compound. You can either use a potato masher or a stopper which works fine if you are without power, or you can use a whip and a half inch drill to mix your compound. Add a decent amount of clean water, and we would recommend stabilizing the bucket with your foot before attempting to mix the taping compound. You also need to remember, the consistency of the taping compound will be thicker when hand taping and much thinner when using a dry banjo, or an automatic taping applicator such as the bazooka. When taping with a banjo, or a bazooka, you must be very careful and make sure the taping compound is mixed thoroughly, without clumps, and debris free. When William is finished mixing the taping compound, you will see him check the consistency of the compound when he lifts the whip out of the bucket, and observes how quickly the taping compound flows off the whip. Please take notice of the consistency of the taping compound in William's drywall pan, as you will soon see. The taping compound is thick enough that it doesn't run off William's 6-inch knife. If this compound were mixed for a dry banjo or a bazooka, the taping compound would quickly run off his knife. Before you start your tape coat, you must chip out and pre-fill any damaged drywall before you start taping. Look for loose drywall paper, and peel it off, if you don't. It will result in a lifting of the paper after multiple coats of compound, or when you apply your PVA primer. At that point you will have to cut the bubble out with a knife, and repair your work. You don't want that. Any deep repairs in your drywall, or large gaps from the drywall installation, you need to use quick-set hot mud compounds, that will dry fast and hard without a lot of shrinkage. When starting your tape coat, you always tape the butt joints first. The butt joints are the non-factory edges, they don't have the recessed edges that the flats have. When applying your taping compound on the butt joints, apply a nice even coat over the entire butt joint. Make sure there are no bare spots, where you can see the drywall paper. This will result in an air bubble or a blister, later on, and that will have to be repaired. After you have your taping compound evenly applied over the butt joint, now is a good time to look and see if there's any loose paper lifting due to the application of the taping compound, if so, now would be a good time to fix it. When you apply your drywall tape onto the butt joint, use your 6 inch knife to guide the drywall tape, and set it into the taping compound. Make sure as you apply the drywall tape all the way across the butt joint, make sure that the tape is centered on the butt joint, and not running off the butt joint. Any joint that is not taped will crack. And when wiping down the butt joint, always remember to start wiping from the middle outward, and make sure that you don't wipe all the taping compound out from under the drywall tape. When you're wiping the drywall tape, Make sure the drywall tape stays centered on the butt joint, and not running off to one side. Duplicate the same method on the flats, that you used on the butt joints. Apply your drywall compound, then apply your taping compound. Make sure the taping compound is level and smooth before applying your drywall tape, Use your 6-inch knife to guide the drywall tape along the joint. Start wiping the drywall tape from the center of the tape, to keep it from balling up.
You will be surprised, how fast, you'll get over time, there's a lot of repetition at this part, of the taping process, just make sure, that your butt joint tape doesn't extend past the flat joint, the flat joint should cap the ends of the butt joint tape. When taping your angles, make sure you coat both sides of the angle first. No skips, hollow areas, and the taping compound is level and smooth. Before inserting the drywall tape into the angle, take your fingers and fold the drywall tape in half. Then pull with one hand and then crease the drywall tape with the other hand as you pull the drywall tape between your fingers. Be careful not to cut yourself in the process. When you have a good section of drywall tape already creased, use your 6 inch knife to insert the drywall tape into the angle. As you're working your way down setting the drywall tape into the taping compound, in the angle, make sure there are no wrinkles in the drywall tape, or that the drywall tape is bunching up. By doing this, it will make it a lot easier to wipe down, and it will help you keep a sharp corner. When you start wiping the drywall tape, as before, start in the center of the tape and work outward. Make sure you keep a sharp corner, and you don't wipe all the taping compound out from under the tape. The corners of the 6 inch knife are extremely sharp, so be careful not to cut in the inner corner of the drywall tape, when wiping it down. This is why it's important, to pre-crease your drywall tape before you insert it into the angle. Now we're ready to install the corner bead. There are different types of corner bead you can use. You can use a nail on corner bead, or you can use a tape on corner bead. Nail on corner bead is nailed every 6 to 8 inches, and if bumped, it can cause a loose section of the corner bead to pop, and cause the drywall compound to fall off, or it could just cause cracks along the edge of the corner bead. With tape on corner bead, you have a constant bond to the wall, the full length of the corner. To start, apply your taping compound to the full length of the area, that you want to install your tape on corner bead on. Apply compound on both sides. Remember, load up the corner with the taping compound, then make sure you smooth it out so it is even and level. And now, you're ready to install the tape on corner bead, the first thing you'll do is to flare the paper that is on the tape on corner bead. This makes it possible to install the tape on corner bead without accidentally, scraping the taping compound off any of the areas where the tape on corner bead is going to be. This would result in a blister in your corner bead and will most definitely be showing up after the area is painted. Now you're ready to install the tape on corner bead, as you just witnessed, William just flared the paper, that is on the tape on corner bead. Now take the tape on corner bead, and set it into the taping compound, make sure the tape on corner bead is sitting on the corner squarely. William will show you how to gauge, with his 6 inch knife, if you have the tape on corner bead set squarely on the corner, this is extremely important. Wipe down the tape on corner bead, by starting in the middle, and work your way outward. Wiping both sides of the tape on corner bead as you go, and use your 6 inch knife to gauge, to make sure that it is on correctly. When using your 6 inch knife, to gauge if the corner bead is going on correctly, just place your 6 inch knife, from the very corner of the corner bead and look for a gap of light, between the drywall and the bottom of your 6 inch knife. You don't want the 6 inch knife, not to be touching the very corner of the tape on corner bead, because the tape on corner bead is rolling up on one side or the other. This would make that section of tape on corner bead very vulnerable to chipping, due to the buildup of drywall compound, to make that corner. Now, I'll briefly touch on spotting screws, use your 6 inch knife, you can coat each screw individually, or you can use this technique, and coat a whole row of screws with one swipe. 
Being that this area is going smooth wall, it will take additional coats of drywall compound, to hide all the imperfections. Smooth wall requires, 3 coats, if not 4 coats, of drywall compound over the flats, and over the butt joints, 4 coats on the corner bead, especially if the corner is a bullnose corner bead, and 4 coats of drywall compound on the screws, with the last coat being a full 6 inch wide coat. If we were going a full level 5 smooth wall, the entire wall surface would be given a full skim coat of drywall compound, finish sanded with 220 grit screen, and then block sanded, by hand, using a 250 or a 500 watt halogen light. As you can see, William is using his 10 inch knife to gauge, how much all purpose joint compound, this flat might use. The first coat of all purpose compound William will be applying, will be done with his 10 inch knife. If you are working on a long ceiling or a long section of wall, you'll have to do it in sections. First, load up the flat with the all purpose compound, using long even strokes, working a section, that you feel comfortable doing at one time. After Willem has loaded up the flat with the all-purpose compound, watch how William feathers the edges of the compound first, before removing any compound off of the flat. Watch, how William uses his 10-inch knife, as he starts removing the excess all-purpose compound. He's using long even strokes and laying his knife lower to the drywall on his final pass. Then, when William is finished with this flat, he will use his 10 inch knife, again to see if he pulled too much compound out of the flat. Normally, a butt joint, a non-factory edge, would create a bump in the wall or ceiling that you have to try to hide. In our series, drywalltechnique.com, series 1, pre-rock, and drywall installation, we cover the use of butt boards and cover their great value, in keeping the wall or ceiling as flat as possible. As you can see, this butt joint is recessed, not protruding from the wall, if you're not comfortable, floating this butt joint with a 12 or 14 inch knife. You can load the butt joint area, using your 12 or 14 inch knife, but make your final pass with a 2 or 3 foot aluminum derby, or even a simple straight edge like this. If you're going to attempt to use a makeshift derby, make sure you clean the surface of your makeshift derby, between each pass, up, or across the joint. An aluminum derby is a little bit more forgiving, but as a rule of thumb, keep them as clean as possible, so they're not dragging debris along with it, which may cause scratches in your work. Now that the flats and the butt joints are coated, we're going to start coating the angles. Use your 6 inch knife and slowly start applying the all purpose compound on one side of the angle. Be sure to coat all the way into the angle, use nice long smooth strokes, keep the all purpose compound at an even thickness, as you slowly run your 6 inch knife down the angle. Now that you have the initial coat applied, in a small workable section as you are going, now it's time to feather the edge of what you just coated, before making the final passes. When coating angles by hand, you will always coat one side at a time. One coat on the angle consists of both sides being coated once. It will take two coats, on the angles, to be able to finish sand them for smooth wall. The second coat of all-purpose compound in the angle will consist of a skim coat. Professional, journeyman, drywall finishers, like William, who has 35 years of experience, will be able to apply the finish coat, by coating both sides of the angle at the same time, without digging into the opposite side. William has been working on some of the most expensive, and historical homes in the Seattle area. Using his talents as a plaster restoration master, and subcontractor. 
As we can see, William has moved on to applying the first coat on the corner bead, William is applying the all-purpose compound, onto the corner bead with long, and even strokes. William has a secret, on how he doesn't drop, a lot of compound off his 10-inch knife as he coats. If you were watching closely, when William was applying the coats, on the flats, and the butt joints, did you notice, as he was scooping his all-purpose compound out of his drywall pan, as he scoops the compound out, he feathers both sides of the knife of the compound before he tries to apply it to a surface. William has the corner bead on the beam loaded up, and the edges feathered. Now he will start removing the excess compound from the beam with several passes, on your final pass, you leave very few stops, and no starts, a stop is where you lift your drywall knife off the surface, leaving just a little wave of a compound that is protruding upward, this can be sanded off between coats of compound. A start is, where your knife begins, and leave an indentation in the compound, which will most likely, need to be filled in. Remember, stops good, starts bad, unless you're starting in the corner, or the beginning of a flat, butt, or corner bead, where you will not see it. And please remember, when you made your final pass, on a stick of corner bead that you're coating, take your knife, and run it down the edge of the bead, and remove the remaining, wet all-purpose compound, before moving on to the next area. When finishing drywall, there are a lot of procedures, that will be duplicated, for each coat. This section of the wall has been brought to its final coat of compound, three coats of the compound on the butts and flats, with the final, fourth coat consisting of a tight skim coat. The screws have had, three coats of compound, but with the fourth coat consisting of a full six inch wide, skim coat, capping off the screws. The angles have received, two full coats, a sanding, then a third, tight skim coat of all-purpose compound. William is starting his finished sanding, but before we dive into this, I must recommend you wear a face mask during any, and all sanding. This is to protect your lungs and to keep you from developing any respiratory issues. William is finished sanding with a sanding pole, with a new sheet of 220 grit screen, a new sheet of 220 screen, is still extremely coarse, you will need to rub it against a clean metal or aluminum object, like the foot tread of an aluminum ladder, or the metal braces of the ladder. Something to wear down the screen just a little first. During this final sanding process, you must use a 250 or a 500 watt halogen, shine the halogen down the wall while you're sanding. This will show you the shadows, of the imperfection that need to be addressed. Shining the light directly at the wall will only flood the surface with light, and it will keep you from seeing the imperfections. At this point, William has started finish sanding with a fine, extra fine sanding sponge, sand with one hand, and use the halogen in the other hand, shining the light, down the wall, across the wall, and up the wall, to find all the imperfections that need to be sanded out, or that will need some touch-up with all-purpose compound. We are now at the final, but the most crucial step in this smooth wall finish, we must use a water sponge, to lay down all the fuzzed up drywall paper, on the wall, from sanding between multiple coats, this step, must not be skipped, and must be done right. Watch how William uses the water sponge, only running the water sponge on the perimeter of the screws, the flats, the angles, and the butt joints. William doesn't run the water sponge across any of the newly coated areas, because it will remove the dried all-purpose compound you have already finished sanded, and could possibly ruin your work. We are at the conclusion of this series, William and I hope, you've enjoyed this remastered series too. We hope this was beneficial to you as you proceed with your project. The drywalltechnique.com family wishes you all the best, and until the next time, we meet. Take care, and God bless.